are excited about doing that. I, I love missionaries and said in Sunday school, they're my heroes. And uh, it's a, just a joy to be here today. I, I really am thankful for the opportunity. I do want to say uh, the football camp, uh, we, we call it man camp. We, we um, take pride in being politically incorrect. <laughs> yes, sir. This time we'll, I was halfway tempted to keep them in here, uh, but uh, let's stand and we'll dismiss our junior church. I know the hour can. You boys don't be messing around, I'll make you take a lap. <laughs> they ignored me like usual. Well, thank the Lord. I appreciate him showing the the uh, video on the on the football camp. Uh, we um, we do not allow moms to come. I always like the reaction when I say that. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's uh, there is a desperate desperate need, not only in our country, but I'm telling you, in, in Christian school realm. Uh, for young men to develop into real men that stand for the Lord. And um, it, it's a huge burden to me. I, I love young people, uh, and it's just a huge burden on my heart. Uh, we've got to have another generation of Jesus Terry's uh, that will stand up and, and stand true. And uh, compromise is killing uh, Christianity. And... Um, we got to have some young men that'll stand for the truth, and that's that's been our burden. I was telling preacher, I think one of the reasons the Lord has so blessed the camp is because the men come to help. There's no agenda other than to try to get the hearts of young men to serve God and to make Him a priority. Whether God calls them to preach or whether they are a plumber or electrician or whatever, just make God number one and and serve Him, and that's. Uh, that's our great, uh, great burden and purpose for the camp. Uh, the Lord has been amazingly good to us. We don't take stupid chances. We have uh, usually four uh, registered nurses that are on the campgrounds at all times during the week, um, or during the day anyway, and then we have a doctor that makes rounds and from the, the area that uh, checks and see if anybody needs x-rayed or anything like that. And, and uh, I've, had, I've had mamas... Uh, yeah, but what if they what if they break their leg? It heals. It really does. You 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 learn from those things. I broke my leg playing football, and I played the next season. And you know, and and uh, but those are lessons that are life reality, and you learn things from all of those things. But God has been gracious to us. We've not had any major type injuries. Uh, we've had a few broken bones, but nothing major. Uh, we have three EMTs that come every year and help. And, uh, and if there's anything that, that uh, seems to be a, a valid concern, we make sure that they get x-rayed and that kind of thing. So we don't take chances that are, are foolish. Um, but we pray all year about it, and the Lord's been good to give us uh, protection over the camp. But uh, been amazing what, what God has done. We have had uh, invitations go on for over two hours at times uh, where the Holy Ghost of God just um, broke hearts and... Uh, we literally have had puddles of tears on on the altar, and and uh, so it's all about that. It's all about God doing a work in hearts and and uh, transforming lives. We had uh, about two, three years ago, I think it was. We must have been a either a separation or a divorce situation where the dad sent the boy to football camp. Mama wasn't real happy about it, and she called one day, and our secretaries that are there. Uh, answered the phone and she said I need to talk to my little boy my his his daddy sent him to that concentration camp <laughs> we said you should have told her yeah we concentrate on the Bible and we concentrate on Jesus <laughs> and, you know but anyway she was very gracious she said well I promise you we will find him he's I, I promise he's okay but we'll have him call you so she said when the boy came in and she he called his mom on the phone and she's sitting there and she said she could hear the boy say, what is wrong with you, Mom? I'm having the time of my life. <laughs> you know? So God's been good, and, and uh, there's been a real, real moving the Spirit of God. The men that preach, 
That's some of the best preaching I've ever heard in my whole life. And uh, it's amazing what God has done, things that we never planned on, but been, many of the preachers that come and help uh, say that, you know, it's, it's like revival to them. Uh, so many times we've heard them say, man, we came here to help the boys, but we got help. And uh, that's just the, the Lord working. And uh, so we, we thank the Lord for it, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to share that with you. I do want to preach a little bit, so if you'd open your Bibles, please. Preach, do you usually stand during the reading of the Bible? or Okay, it's whatever you want. I, I just follow the preacher until I get my love offering. So if you, if you stand, please, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 4. Again, I'm going to begin reading with verse 23. It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis, from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond Jordan. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. This is where the Lord uh, preaches the Sermon on the Mount, we call. And it's for several chapters. And if you'll go over with me to chapter 8. He's finished preaching. I'm glad that the Lord was a long-winded preacher. Makes me feel better. Chapter 8, verse 1, it says, When he was come down from the mountain, notice this again, great multitudes followed him. Then go to chapter 9. Here's a familiar text oftentimes preached on in missions conferences. If you look at verse 35. Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And then chapter 10 is when he sends the 12 out to preach to uh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I want to preach for a little bit on affected by the multitudes. And would you pray with me, please? Our Lord, we sure need you. We sure confess, Lord, we're absolutely nothing without thee. So, Father, would you please take charge of the entire service. Our hearts have been blessed with the music. The privilege, Lord, to sing praises unto you. You're so worthy. I ask of you, please, Holy Ghost of God, please now, would you move in our hearts, and as I yield to thee, would you fill me and endue me and use me this morning, Lord. Guide my mind to say what you want. Lord, you know the needs in every single heart, and as the church is burdened, Lord, and the pastor is concerned that they do what you want concerning the giving to missions, I pray that you would have our hearts, Lord, tuned in and open, Holy Spirit, to your leading and speaking. And I pray, Lord, that if there should be somebody here, Lord, that has never trusted thee as Savior, that you draw that heart. For many of us that are saved, would you do something, Lord, in this hour that would count for eternity for thee? We need you, Lord. Please, Holy Ghost of God, manifest your power and presence. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In chapters 4 through chapter 9 of Matthew, it takes place in about a year's time. There are six miracles that are recorded for us before chapter 9, and then there's five more miracles that are recorded for us in chapter 9. We're told that when the Lord sees the multitudes in chapters 4 through 8, he, he begins teaching them truth, uh, truth from heaven. He shows them by his power that he was God. He was not just a man, but he was God. 
And, and now it tells us he comes to verse 35 we read here in chapter 9. And, uh, and, and, and he, he talks about how that he went through the, the villages and the cities and healing and uh, sickness and diseases among the people. And then verse 38, I'm sorry, verse 36 says, but. So now he's not going to do all of this himself. Up to this point, the multitudes have watched. He has performed miracle after miracle. He has proved who he says he was, that he was God in flesh. But now he's not going to do it all himself. He's now passing on the responsibility to his disciples. The Bible tells us he saw, he was moved, and then he commanded his apostles to go preach the gospel to the lost tribes of Israel, or the lost sheep of, his, of the house of Israel. So I want you to consider with me quickly this morning what he saw, why he was so moved, why aren't we so moved, and how to get moved. What did he see? He saw people, it says, as hopeless sheep with no answers, no direction, no one to help. You know, it, I've been preaching for well over 43 years now, 43 years full time. And you know, it, it still burdens me to see how many people are so incredibly deceived and so incredibly miserable. And, and, and the Bible has all the answers for them, and yet the, the devil so seems to blind them that they continue on in their foolishness and just creating more misery. I love, I love when the, 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 the maniac or demon-possessed man there in Gadara, he said to the Lord when he came and fell at his feet, he said, torment me not. Are you kidding? You're already living in torment. I mean, you're living in tombs. You're living in the graves. You have no answers. You're cutting yourself. You're running around in shame and nobody can control you. And you're saying, Lord, torment me not. But that's exactly what the Lord's seeing with these people as he looks upon the multitudes. They're hopeless. They have no answers. Listen, we can drive down the street, uh, Christian, and see them walking around with their pants hanging halfway down and, and, and look at them with disgust and say, boy, how wicked and foolish these people. But no wonder they're wicked and foolish. They're blinded. They have no hope. They're like sheep without a shepherd. And that's what the Lord saw. It moved him. He saw them in a way that so moved them. We looked at this in, in, in the Sunday school hour in Acts 16 when the apostle Paul was going to go preach in Asia and the Holy Spirit forbid him. And, 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 and then Paul was given that vision of that, that one crying in Macedonia, come help us. That's what the Lord saw. He saw people with great need. When's the last time, child of God, that you let it break your heart over somebody who was lost? on their way to hell forever, with no hope, no answers. When's the last time you let God keep you awake at night, praying for somebody who's on their way to hell, lost? I mean, he, what he saw was these hopeless people. William Borden, when William Borden, uh, the famous Borden family, and, and, and uh, when William Borden graduated from high school and his dad gave him a, a, a graduation present to to fly across the world, or I'm sorry, to, to sail across the world. And, and, um, and so he, he got on this trip and he said every port that they stopped at, he was a Christian young man just graduating from high school, but he said every port that they stopped at, all that he could see was millions of lost souls. When's the last time you were on your way to work and you saw the people driving by and you just thought people driving their way into hell? They have no hope. They have no, no, no answers, no direction. I mean, you look at our country today, absolute mess. You look at Washington, D.C., and you see people with absolutely no values, no direction. The Lord looked at the multitude. He saw they were blinded by religion. Look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 3 with me, or chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Blind. 
no hope. I was recently in Tennessee preaching and I went out to eat the pastor's son uh, who actually had been through our football camp and, and now he's grown and he's kind of his dad's right-hand man in the church, but he's a state trooper. And, uh, and I told him I needed his phone number in case I ever need to call him for any help as I'm traveling through Tennessee. But anyway, he, uh, he and his, his, his wife and their new little baby, they came out to breakfast with us and and uh, we were sitting there, and he was telling a story just the day before. He said, a guy came driving. I'm in my squad car. He said, this guy's doing over 100, drives right by me, smiling at me. He said, so I, I, I chase him down. I pull him over. The guy's drunk as could be. He said, I get him out of the car, and he says, Ossifer, you're, you're sure not going to arrest me, are you? He said, man, you're drunk. I have to arrest you. He said, well, I... I'm not as bad as I was yesterday, and that policeman didn't arrest me. <laughs> He's got it all on his, his body cam, you know, and we're laughing about it. But isn't that sad? I mean, that guy has no other life than that. And there's multitudes out there like that. They have no answers. They're blinded by the God of this world. And the Lord saw the multitudes. I'm glad the Lord saw me as a preacher's kid that needed to be saved and sent the Holy Ghost of God to convict my heart. You ought to be thankful that he, he saw you in your need and sent somebody or somebody with a burden, Holy Spirit, to convict you and draw your heart to him. He saw, he saw uh, Zacchaeus up that tree that day. You know, when, when Jesus was walking through uh, Jericho that day, he wasn't on a leisurely stroll. He didn't just by chance see Zacchaeus up there. We know that because he concluded the story about Zacchaeus, and he said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He was out that day looking for Zacchaeus. He knew Zacchaeus had a need that he needed a Savior, and he saw him up that tree. I'm glad that the Lord was willing to go through the storm on the Sea of Galilee so that he could get to that demon-possessed man in Gadara because he knew that that man was there. He knew he needed a Savior. I'm glad the Lord saw fit to get a hold of the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road that day when he was Saul of Tarsus in rebellion against, uh, against the Lord Jesus Christ. But he, had, uh, he knew the need, and he got a, a hold of, of uh, uh, Saul's heart, and he got saved and became the Apostle Paul. He sees the multitude at lost, blind, without a guide. It was in, in uh, Kentucky preaching in the... The pastor was out of town. The, his son-in-law was a system pastor. And after the evening service, he said, you want to go get a bite to eat? I said, it's my favorite sport. And so y'all can laugh at my jokes. It encourages me. And so we went out to eat. And it was, they were about ready to close down. And there wasn't anybody hardly in the restaurant at all. This lady came. Her name was Jen. And Jen was our, our waitress and and so nobody was around much, and so we struck up a conversation. And, and uh, I said, Jen, I said, um, where are you from? She said, well, I, I'm from uh, uh, Wisconsin. And she mentioned the place. I said, well, you know, I preached in a ski camp up there in Wisconsin. And, and, and you know, she was right by where she grew up, and so we kind of had a connection. And, and I said, so how long have you been down here? And she said, well, just a little over a year and a half or so. And, and I said, well, do you have a church you go to here? Well, she said, you know, I, I, I grew up Catholic, and she said there's, I, I went to this Catholic church here one time, but she said, you know, it's just really, um, just, you know, it's really, uh, I said, boring? She said, yeah, really boring. And I said, I understand. I said, but I'd like to encourage you to come over to, uh, to this church. I said, I've known the pastor here for many, many years. I promise you, you won't be bored. And you know what, Jen, he'll just show you from the Bible how you can actually know for sure you're going to heaven. She said, are you serious? I said, yeah, it's amazing. I said, but the Bible actually tells you that. Really? I said, would you mind if I take a few minutes and show you that from the Bible? She said, no, I really need to know that. And in a few minutes, bless her heart, man, through tears, she asked the Lord to save her. But they're everywhere, folks, they're everywhere. Jesus saw the multitudes, hopeless, without any help. In Romans 10, 14, it says, How shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they hear, uh, believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So what did he see? He saw the multitudes without hope. 
Then I want you to notice, why was he so moved? Well, it tells us there in, in verse uh, 36, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. God, underline that word in your Bible, compassion. Why was he so moved? Webster defines compassion as a suffering with another, painful sympathy, a sensation of sorrow excited by the distress or misfortunes of another. Compassion is a mixed passion compounded of love and sorrow. The psalmist said in Psalm 78, 38, but he being full of compassion forgave their iniquity. You know, the, the, the stats tell us that the world's population is now over 7 billion. That's amazing. They say that, that almost 3,000 language groups and over 1,700, uh, uh, there are, I'm sorry, there are over 3,000 language groups and over 1,700 of them do not have a Bible that's ever been translated into their language. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? I mean, I grew up in America. Honestly, sometimes I almost feel guilty. God, you are so good to me. You allowed me to grow up in a home where my mom and dad knew Jesus and loved him. You allowed me to grow up in a home where I, I don't ever remember walking in the house that there wasn't several Bibles. I mean, I, I got to grow up in a home where I heard the gospel from the time I was little. I had mom and dad that I never heard yell at each other and cuss at each other in my whole life. They actually loved each other. I had friends that wanted to come over just because there was peace in our home. I got to grow up with that. But I'm going to tell you, that's not the norm. And one day I realized there's multitudes of people out there. They've never experienced that. And you get outside of America into countries where they've never seen a Bible. I was getting ready to go to preach a missions conference and I got on an airplane. And there was sitting next to me on the airplane a young man in his early 20s. And a very nice looking young man and seemed very polite. And I introduced myself as we took off and uh, he said, hi, my name's Bud. And I said, well, nice to meet you, Bud. I said, uh, where, are you, where are you from? Are you going, going up to this area to, to meet family? He said, oh, no, no, I'm not from this area. He said, I... I, I, I have an acquaintance I met, and I'm going up there, but I'm from Holland. And I said, oh, Holland, Michigan. I know where Holland, Michigan is. He said, no, no, I, I mean Holland, the country Holland. I thought, well, isn't that amazing? I mean, here's a, the Lord sits this guy next to me on the plane. I'm going to preach a missions conference. Here's a guy from the country of Holland. And uh, we got talking. I said, well, Bud, did you go to church any growing up? He started laughing. And not in a mocking way. He just said, sir... I never even saw a church ever in Holland. He said, now I heard maybe a couple of times there were some real old people that once or twice a year would get together somewhere that they called a church, but I never saw a church. I said, you ever, you ever look inside of a Bible? He said, I've never seen a Bible in my life. I said, no kidding. I said, you believe there's a God? He said, well, he said, I guess maybe, um, you know, if I was really in a lot of trouble, he said, I, I don't, I don't think it'd come to my mind that I'd call on a God. So I guess I don't. And I said, well, you seem to be a very intelligent young man. He was over from the university on some program. And, and I said, obviously, you're an intelligent young man. Surely you understand that just you look around nature, you can see everything has a logical system. I said, even a tree has a system by which its roots go down and it gets its nutrients. I said, surely as intelligent as you are, you don't just think that all exploded into existence one day. There's got to be an intelligent designer behind all that. And he just stared at me and listened. And I did my best, best to explain to him that that designer is God Almighty and he loves you and we have failed him. And I explained the gospel to him and he listened. Before he got off the plane, he didn't get saved. He said to me, who knows, maybe one day you go to Holland and start a church. And I got off of that plane and I thought, dear God, I could have grown up in Holland. I could have grown up where I never saw a Bible. I mean, the Lord was moved with compassion when he saw that hopelessness. Uh, over a thousand tribes have never one time ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. No answers, 
No one to guide him. No one to help him. He was moved with compassion. Why aren't we so moved? Well, could it be because compassion requires love and sorrow? You see, we live in an amusement-oriented society where nobody wants a burden today. We can read about the old-time Christians that would sometimes spend hours at the altar until the early mornings weeping over their lost loved ones. We're too busy for that today, aren't we? We're like Martha of old, cumbered about with serving, and we don't have time to do the better part. But our Lord was moved with that compassion. I mean, we want to, we, we, we've grown up with the entertainment world. And now the church has become, hey, let's all just entertain and that'll get us a crowd. And I have all the time, all the time I have people say to me, but you know, those happy, clappy churches that they don't really have a real Bible and no real preaching and no real conviction. And, but they got a huge crowd of people. I said, yeah, so does Joe's Barn Grill down the road. I mean, it's spiritual. But our Lord was moved with compassion. There was a love mixed with sorrow. And, and I'm afraid, Christian, that we were moving further and further away from having a real burden, a burden that, that bothers us, a burden that grieves us, a burden that motivates us. And maybe the reason we're not so moved is we become so amusement-oriented that if it's not fun, we're not interested. Jude said, and of some have compassion, making a difference. J. Hudson Taylor, a great missionary, was home, and after having furlough in England before he returned to China in the late 1800s, he stood up and he made the statement, we, we may have more wealth in these days, this is in the late 1800s, we may have more wealth in these days, better education, greater comfort in traveling and in our surroundings, even as missionaries. But have we the spirit of urgency, the deep inward convictions that moved those who went before us? Have we the same passion of love, personal love for the Lord Jesus Christ? If these are lacking, it is a loss for which nothing can compensate. I'm afraid we've come to the place we seldom weep over the lost. In fact, I'm afraid we're not even looking for those limitless whitened fields that are ready to harvest. But they're still out there. Our Lord saw He was moved with compassion. Are we? Maybe you have family members you know are lost. My wife, is so burdened about a couple of her family members. I, I, at times, I've been afraid she's going to irritate them, but she can't help herself because she's so moved with a burden that they're going to go to hell forever. What's happened to us? Some of us can remember when soul winning was flourishing. Oh, I know, people are scared to answer the door today. I know it's not easy. But the Lord didn't say go because it's easy. He didn't say go because everybody's going to respond. He said go give them a chance. Care enough to get the, the, the gospel out to them. You know, I'm convinced that we have little fruit that remains today because most people can tell if we really care or not. You know, you could just get the chip off the shoulder. Yeah, preacher's going to preach on soul winning, so let's go and we'll do our duty and hopefully nobody will answer the door. <laughs> but people know whether you really care or not. And you see, real compassion is that mix of love and sorrow. There's a pastor in the South. He had a lady in his church, and that lady had prayed and prayed for her husband, and finally she came to the pastor. She said, Preacher, it's getting worse, not better. He's getting more irritable. He, he doesn't even want me to go Wednesday night to church. And it's, the pastor said, Listen, that's not a bad sign. That's a good sign. He's under conviction. Just keep praying. One Sunday morning, he stood up to preach, and just as he was getting started in his introduction, the back doors opened up, and the that dear wife and her husband both walked in. They sat in the back. He said, the guy just stared at him with these beady eyes through the whole sermon. 
gave the invitation. That man walked down the aisle and looked up at him and said, I need to talk to you. He thought, oh man, what's this going to be? He walked off the platform. He said, sir, what, what can I do for you? you? Did you come to get saved? He said, no. He said, I was afraid of that. He said, why'd you come? He said, because I already got saved. He said, I got saved last night, Pastor. He said, really? He said, was it one of our tracks from our church that, that, that your wife gave you? No, it wasn't one of the tracks from your church. Was it one of my sermon tapes maybe you listened to or, or, or a guest preacher? He said, no, it wasn't any preacher I listened to. He said, well, how, what happened? He said, last night, preacher, he said, I know I've been mean and ornery, but I love my wife. And he said, last night, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I reached over and she wasn't in bed. And I thought, man, what's wrong with her? I called her name out. She didn't respond. I got up and I walked down the hallway and I got to the bathroom and I could see the bathroom door was just open a little bit and I could see the light on. He said, man, I thought she's sick. He said, I just pushed the door open a little bit. He said, I saw her on her knees right by the toilet. She had my shoes and they were filled with tears. And I could see the, the light glistening off of those tears in my shoes and she was just crying and weeping. She didn't even know I was standing there and just saying, oh God, please don't let my husband go to hell. Please, Lord, whatever it takes. God, if you've got to take me, then take me, Lord. If that would wake him up so he'd get saved, but please don't let him die and go to hell. He said, Pastor, it broke my heart. He said, I reached down and picked her up and said, Honey, I'm ready to get saved. He said, She showed me how to get saved right there by the toilet. I prayed and got saved. He said, Right by the toilet. I hope it's okay. He said, It's the best toilet testimony I ever heard in my life. Compassion. It does make a difference. What did he see? He saw multitudes without hope. He was moved with compassion. Why aren't we? But how do you get moved? Well, first you've got to see the need. You have to see the need. You've got to go out there and see the need. You've got to see them. Knock on their doors. See them. I think one of the greatest things a Christian can do is visit a mission field and see the need. But we're living in a mission field. You got to pray for labors, he said. And then you give to help send. You know, that good Samaritan not only went and helped that, that wounded man, but he also took him and paid for his, the rent of his room. He said, if there's more owed later, I'll pay for that. You give to help. I mean, the Lord's not going to send all of us to every country. But we can, we can send those that go, that God calls. We can give to that. And then we go where we can go. You can go to your neighbors. You can ask God to give you the opportunity and wisdom to witness to those at work. My dad was out of the ministry during my teenage years and went through some real health problems. And I really got right with the Lord at the end of my freshman year in high school. I was doing all, all right in sports, you know, and Believe it or not, there is an athletic body under all this upholstery. And I, I, uh, I was pretty impressed with myself, but God wasn't so impressed with me. In my ninth grade year, the end of the year, God broke my heart. And um, I remember going forward at church where I started going, and pastor, thank God for him. I still stay in touch with him. I love him dearly. He wasn't afraid to preach to us teenagers and tell us the truth. And I remember going forward and giving my life to the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't want to be in charge anymore. I mess up everything every time I get in charge of anything. And I gave my life to the Lord and said, you, you guide and direct me from here on. And the Lord began to direct me. And I remember at, at high school, my pastor said to me, Hey, Booth, you think you're such a hot shot out there? Why don't you start carrying your Bible on top of your books? We didn't have a Christian school anywhere around, didn't know anything about that in those days. Went to public school, and so I said, well, I guarantee I'm not chicken. And I started carrying my Bible on top of my books to the public school, and guys would ask me, what are you bringing your Bible in here to the locker room for? I said, so you'd ask me, and I could show you what it says in there. But you know what it taught me? It taught me that I need to be, watch out for souls everywhere. 
I was always so concerned I was going to lose my testimony at the high school, and a few times I did. But I didn't want to lose my testimony for fear that somebody would have an excuse to go to hell because of me. We've got to get back to reaching those within our reach. And then those that are without of our reach, we pay for those. We, we support those. My mom, I was visiting mom and dad are both in the, with the Lord now. I preach both of their funerals. And my mom, I was visiting over at the house, and, and my mom said, son, they couldn't get out of the house much at that point. And our neighbor, I know that, that he's dying, and you think maybe you could go by and talk to him. She said, I don't think he's saved. I said, I'll go over there. Knocked on the door. Lady, the, the wife invited me in, and, and I told her I'm uh, your neighbor's son. And, oh, yeah, we love them. They're sweet people. And she invited me, and I said, I heard your husband's not, fit, not doing well. And she said, no. And she took me back to his room, and there was Ed sitting, laying there in bed, and he was days away from dying. And uh, I told him who I was, and I, I said, you know, my, my folks are concerned for you. They love you. And, I said, you know, they wanted me to come over and just visit with you. And he was very kind. And I said, Ed, I said, um, anybody showed you how you could be sure you're going to heaven when you die? He said, no, sir, nobody's ever showed me that. And I opened the scripture and showed him how to be saved. And he trusted Jesus just a week before he went to heaven. But they're out there. We've got to go where we can. It's not about just giving to missions to get the chip off our shoulder. That's our part across the world, but we're also to do our part here at home and to reach those we can reach within our reach. I need to close. I read this story about a pastor that went on a missions trip. He was from Baltimore. He went on a missions trip to Hong Kong and, uh, and spent several days there. On his last day, he, was, he visited this really nice bakery that was in a, in a city there and and while he was in that bakery, he was, was looked up and, and a big glass front, and he could see that there was this uh, little girl, probably an orphan, looked quite disheveled, and, and she had her face pressed up against the glass, looking in to see those goodies in that bakery. She looked so long she fell asleep with her face up against the glass. It was evident that she was hungry. He took a picture of that, and when he got back to his church on Sunday night, he showed the slides of his trip to Hong Kong, and he finished the slides with that picture of that little girl, and he told the story of sitting in that bakery and enjoying the baked goods and seeing that little girl with her face pressed up against the glass and falling asleep. And then one of the members in the congregation stood up and said, Pastor? He said, what? He said, what would you do about that? And he looked at her and dropped his head and said, nothing. So I ask you, what are you going to do about it? The need across the world is, it's mind-blowing. People with no hope. Our Lord was moved with compassion. Are we? Are we moved with love and, and yet that burden, that sorrow to reach them? Do people know you care? When's the last time you led somebody to Christ? Well, I don't know real well how to do that. You tell them how you got saved. It's the most wonderful tool you've got to reach people for Jesus. But all of us can reach somebody. And then the privilege that you're going to have here in a couple of weeks to, to put what God's put on your heart to give to missions and have a part in that. Don't be like that pastor. And one day stand before our Lord. You know what the Lord's going to ask? Scripture tells us on that day of, of handing out reward and loss of reward. He said he's going to give us according to those things that we have done. You know, he's going to ask you, what'd you do? What'd you do? Gave you the privilege to grow up in America and you had all these blessings, a wonderful church, and here were these people living in these places didn't even have a Bible. What would you do about it? I mean, you had more money than most people in the world would dream of having. What would you do with it? One day we're going to stand 
And we're going to give an account for those opportunities. One of the greatest opportunities you have being a part of an independent Baptist church like this is to be able to invest in missions. It's worthwhile to take the time to pray, dear God, what would you help me to do? What would you help me to do? It'd be good for some of us to come to an altar and say, Lord, it's so easy to get distracted in this life from what's really important. I need to get back to reaching souls for Christ. I need to do my part. There are people in my heart that I know are lost, and it's been a long time since I've been brokenhearted about them, Lord. Help me to get back where I need to be. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our Lord, we love you. We thank you for loving us. Forgive us, Lord, when sometimes we are so caught up with all of the cares of this world, Lord, that we, we lose that compassion, we lose that burden. And, and so, Lord, you give us opportunities like this to reset and get our focus back on what pleases you and what you're most concerned about. And Lord, you came to seek and to save that which was lost. Help us. Help us to do our part where we can and then to help those who go where we can't. I pray you'll bless the invitation time now. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody looking. I want to ask this morning if you'd say, Brother Booth, thank God I'm saved. I remember where I was when somebody showed me from the Bible how I could put my faith and trust in Christ. The Holy Spirit of God convicted my heart. And I knew I needed a Savior. And I, with a repentful heart, called and asked the Lord to save and forgive me. And I know if I died right this minute, I know I'd go to heaven. If that's your honest testimony, would you indicate that by raising your hand? Just raise it up and put it down and be honest about it. Thank you. I want to ask you this morning how many would say, thank the Lord I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm sure grateful for that. But I needed that reminder this morning. The Holy Spirit of God is working in my heart right now and convicting me. And I know there's some things I need to get settled with the Lord this morning that he's dealing with my heart about. Pray for me as a Christian. God speak to my heart. Would you slip your hands of Christians? God speak to your heart this morning. God bless you. Thank God for your tender hearts. Maybe there's others. Yeah, brother, maybe something I never even mentioned, but the Holy Spirit doing his work is mentioning to you. You say, yeah, include me in the prayer. God's dealing with my heart as well. Just slip your hand up, put it down. There's somebody else. God bless you. Somebody else. I wonder if there's somebody who would say, to be honest with you, if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I don't like to think about it. It bothers me. If I could be sure, according to the Bible, I need to get that settled for sure. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Put it up and put it down. I won't embarrass you. I would like to pray for you. Please stand with me for prayer. After I pray, the music will begin. God spoke to your heart. Let's not hesitate. Let's find a place at the altar. If you raised your hand or you didn't, God dealing with your heart, let's come and find a place at the altar. Maybe you need to come and just say, Dear God, I, I want to be clear on what you want me to give to missions. Father, bless now the invitation time. I pray that you give victories, seal decisions, help us be humble enough to respond the way you want us to this morning. And I pray you would be pleased with all that takes place now at this invitation time. Lord, if there's somebody that needs to be saved, nobody raise their hand. But God, bring them. Let them come and speak to the pastor and, and let him know that they want to be sure they're saved. For other Christians, Lord, you're dealing with hearts. We pray now you'll give victories. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. The music plays. God spoke to your heart. Why don't you come right now, would you?